Katerina, you're a writer, a publisher, and a translator. You are the co-author of uh, Ukrainian Nights and a co-editor of Aus dem Nebel der Krisis. Sorry for the pronunciation. Des Krieges. Des Krieges, sorry. Uh, mm. The Fog of War, uh, which is, hasn't been translated yet. And you're also a co-founder and the editor of the Ukrainian publishing house Medusa. You've also been the editor of ProStory, a magazine on art, literature, and social critique. Katerina, we I remind people listening to us, some of them were probably already there a year ago, but we invited you exactly a year ago, along with the Russian writer Sergei Lebedev. The invasion of Ukraine by Russia had just started. And since then, much has happened, mostly for the bad, but maybe also for the good with Western Europe, finally considering its Eastern flank as a true part of it, and the, the AU eventually welcoming Ukraine, but at what cost? So a year later, is Europe doing enough to support Kiev since the beginning of the Russian invasion of your country? That's my first question, Katerina. Very direct one. Yeah, thank you, Katerina. Ich, uh, ich. <laughs> Uh, first, I want to thank you for inviting me. It's really interesting to see you, to meet you uh, after one year. And uh, my question is, my answer is also quite direct. Uh, of course, it's not enough. And not because uh, we are very greedy or unthankful, but just because uh, the war is ongoing and uh, it means that not everything was done to stop it. And uh, I mean, uh, by to stop the war, I mean, of course, the, to stop Russia, not just to freeze uh, the conflict uh, how it is now and to wait for something, but really stop this aggression. And uh, it is a, a big challenge, I think, for many people. It is. It costs... Uh, too much energy and <laughs> for people in Ukraine to cope with war, to fight. And uh, of course, it's also challenging for our other countries. But it is um, yeah, our reality today. And it's our task to deal with it somehow. Um. I've asked you maybe some for some uh, indication of what you think Europe should or could do, uh, how the, the help could be maybe more efficient, different. But I want wanted just before we we, we start uh, in a more deep and maybe uh, deep conversation to say that we you gave a, a concluding speech uh, at debates on Europe in Sofia a week ago, and we have published. Um, this uh, speech on Vox Europe, translated in many languages. And in this speech, you say, uh, I'm going to quote you, I hope to be able to refrain from making moral reproaches, but I would still like to raise some ethical questions. The truth of death is that we see it without the embellishment of heroic rhetoric and admiration for dignity and courage. It is often said that Ukrainians and themselves are willingly saying so that they have lost their fear. But of course, giving up the fear of death can be the key to freedom. But does Europe attribute to us the virtues of courage and indomitability because we live in a territory that is frightening in its proximity? And does Ukraine frighten with its identity? So I'm just posing this <coughs> including speech you gave, because I think it's very strong. And you-, Thank you. You you give this uh, again. You 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 put the finger on the spot of the proximity of Ukraine and of the frontiers in that article. That you know, I think we're posting in the chat. Yeah, thank you very much for translating it. For me, it's a um, yeah great honor uh, that I'm listened to that. Uh, people are listening to these words and it gives me hope that um, yeah, I was able to broaden a little bit this frame of imagination of how, uh, yeah, 
how to end the war, what is possible, what is not done yet. Uh, these are questions, yeah, which I have uh, all the time in my head. And uh, of course, also the questions, what can I say? What else should be said in order to change the situation? And <clears throat> I think, um, I don't know if it's, um, yeah, uh, if it fits uh, to your question. Um, I think um, first uh, we should um, uh, maybe um, critically reflect uh, the status quo of today and this idea, also this idea of Ukraine as a borderland. Somehow it is uh, now clear. It was uh, definitely not the case one year ago uh, that Ukraine should be supported by weapons, by yeah, delivering uh, weapons. But uh, at the same time, it's a common sense that uh, the physical job will be done by Ukrainians. And uh, they are somehow the protectors of this uh, border between uh, aggression and freedom. And <laughs> I think it would be good also to question this uh, idea why we need someone else to project all these ideas of heroism? Why don't we yeah, try ourselves in this role or other countries being uh, seeing their political subjectivity in fighting against Russia in another way? Uh, for instance, in German, there is a debate about being a Kriegspartei. I don't know, like war party, yeah, mm -hmm. or war, war side. belligerent. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and um, of course we don't want, of course we don't want to be the Kriegspartei, even if uh, actually they are already this uh, partei. Uh, on different levels, economically, politically, internationally, I don't know, even by uh, um, giving us all these weapons. But I think it is important to say, yes, we are this uh, site of war, yeah? Or, I'm sorry, how it is again in English? Uh, in, your, in your introduction speech, no, 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 I mean uh, co this... Co-belligerent. Oh, co-belligerent, yeah. Mm. Co-belligerent. Co -belligerent. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's so complicated. Maybe that's why nobody wants <laughs> to be <laughs> in our situation. Yes, and um, I think uh, first we need uh, really to change a mindset. For me, it's uh, um, still difficult to speak about other military units of other countries, uh, yeah, mm, that they are supposed uh, to intervene, that they are also uh, somehow supposed probably to take part. At the same time, I think, uh, if Ukraine is really seen as a part of Europe, and if this war is really seen as a danger for different countries, not only for Ukraine itself, then the strategy would be different. I have no recipes how it, uh, it should be. I think there are enough uh, military experts, some strategists who can elaborate this um, yeah, uh, this uh, new strategy, but I think it's needed because the position uh, to give weapons and again, not so much that so something can escalate, like this dose to give it, 
uh, yeah, this dosed weaponizing, which doesn't really help with the offensive, but rather helps to block somehow some further movings of Russian army or just to keep them there where they are. It's not a very good strategy. And I think uh, nobody wants on, and is ready for a war which could last years. And uh, Ukrainians, of course, are not ready for this. And I don't want them to be ready. I don't want them to live with this idea. We will like have this war next three or four years. I don't want even think uh, then uh, yeah about the future of my country if it if it's the case. But what does it mean for other countries uh, too? It is a big question. That's why I think we need we all need a new strategy. As fight. maybe yeah sorry yeah yeah. Yeah. As a new strategy, you point out and you wrote in, and you said it in your closing speech and you wrote um, I, I, that you do believe in a common European victory. That could maybe be one of the strategies you're uh, mentioning. So you, you, you said that you believe in a common European victory in Ukraine. And my question would be, um, uh, what, what, what would this common European victory look like? Um, oh, <laughs> it is a good question. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I just think um, again. It is uh, my idea, probably my vision, which is which uh, which is supposed to be empowering for European countries that they perceive the victory in this war as their own. And it, it means another form of participation or another form of engagement. So I think I am moving from a result, yeah, utopian result, to the ways how is it possible to achieve. So it's maybe the other way around. What kind of victory it could be it is um, yeah it is <clears throat> a new i don't know peace architecture and a peaceful inclusive europe yeah with a strong uh, democratic uh, position maybe also with mechanisms of protecting democracy in countries where it's not um, so easy at the moment yeah but the question is how to achieve this uh, victory how to come to this yeah point of destination you said and i thought it was very um, moving and strong you you you, you write also how this <coughs> distance is being felt if you go from ukraine and then you travel and you get out of Ukraine and you're in, suddenly in this completely different reality. Uh, so maybe the physical and geographical uh, approach, uh, in a way, Ukraine is, is, of course, physically not included in many ways, as you described it. I mean, could you maybe comment on this a bit further? Yeah, it is... Um... It was always the case that Ukraine was very uh, easy to unsee or not to see. And uh, somehow uh, it can be also interpreted as a, yeah, some space of repression or some, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> displacement of different things like conflicts, like poverty, uh, like I don't know, a lack of democracy, all the things which are quite yeah, present in Europe itself, in different forms, in different countries. Uh, but uh, it's difficult to deal with it. It's difficult to, yeah, to solve all these problems. That's why uh, 
yeah the idea of uh, borders of uh, being somehow hermetic concentrated on uh, yeah own issues own countries it was uh, yeah a proper strategy or the um, accepted strategy but <coughs> All this displacement on, and maybe all this ignoring of conflicts of, uh, of yeah, different uh, problematical issues, yeah, they just led to, uh, to war. And now is the question, uh, was the strategy of repre repression or moving of yeah removing all the problems to the borders to the periphery was it right so now it's obvious it was not right because if the war is on periphery it will move and move and move deeper uh, to the center and everything will be shaken uh, then this fragility and its instability will be omnipresent that's why this space should be included in this border yeah should not be like a huge fence mm -hmm. protecting europe from war it just cannot work anymore mm -hmm. and it is i think uh, still a process <clears throat> yeah of admitting of accepting this fact and what does it mean that uh, the opposite strategy could be the right one to open yourself, yeah, to include. And when you include, then you also ask yourself, what can we really do to stop it? How can we build peace in Ukraine? Because if it's in Ukraine, then it will be also yeah in other european countries so it is a very hard process i think but somehow yeah uh, all these hesitations and uh, yeah uh, attempts to ignore or to localize this horrible conflict won't be successful i think unfortunately we came to the point where it's not possible. I think the history of Ukrainian civil, civic society of last 10 years is very dramatic because uh, first people organized themselves or were even active during the revolution almost 10 years ago during Maidan. Then they were trying on one hand to deal with uh, Russian it was called the times hybrid war <laughs> and occupation of Crimea. On the other hand, uh, Ukraine should uh, needed uh, support uh, in, by the process of democratization, of uh, creating of new institutions, etc. And uh, yeah, it was like a double challenge for many people. And then, as uh, one year ago, many of them decided to go to the army. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is also this result of being socialized in such, yeah, <laughs> unboring country as Ukraine <laughs> for the last uh, 10 years. And people, yeah, just took responsibility. I don't know if they expected that it will last so long, like more than one year. But they went there. And now some of them are in captivity. Some of them are dead. Some of them are still fighting or supporting the army. So it's, I think, very hard times for civic society because they are not afraid of responsibility and of risk. And on one hand, this um, 
characteristics yeah are very uh, productive for being political and being effective on the other hand it means that they will be the first who will die in this war that's why i think we yeah we will witness big changes in this landscape of civil society in ukraine probably some new people will come but i don't know now i feel that we are permanently losing those people who were ready to build something new and something good in ukraine probably in europe hmm. just before the war we had another um, antagonisms within the country they were connected with the so-called anti-oligarchs law or laws uh, which were introduced by um, the team of our president Zelensky and it was very interesting to see how media were um, activated for critic of president for all the possible ideas even um, I think even uh, in the context of collaboration with Russia at the moment just not to let this law somehow be implemented that's why these are of course connected uh, issues and of course Ukraine is very much I would say contaminated by um, influence and by uh, cooperation or collaboration with Russian institutions and with Russian um, secu security ser services, intelligence, and so on. And it was a long process of uh, <laughs> which was, yeah, probably started uh, by the Orange Revolution. Uh, 2004 it was a very disappointing surprise for Kremlin that time and since then it was important to uh, keep uh, or to yeah to have uh, control in Ukrainian politics so I think the influence of Russia was strong um, <laughs> uh, during the Maidan so after 10 years of, uh, after the Orange Revolution, we had the chief, I think, of uh, our security service who was Russian citizen. We had a minister of defense who was a Russian citizen. And uh, so the politics of <laughs> demilitarization of Ukraine all these years was also um, provided by pro-Russian politicians or forces, I don't know. And of course, I ask, I'm asking myself today how all these cases will be investigated. Some of them are already obvious and um, I investigated. Uh, some of them still not. I think it, it will be a very long process and it could be successful only if we will have um, a strong presence of your international institutions in Ukraine, also European institutions. I mean, the rule of law and all the connect, yeah, institutions connected with it. It is very crucial for yeah for the process of democratization and deoligarchization of Ukrainian political and uh, economical system. <clears throat> now, of course, I think the influence of oligarchs and of private capital in Ukraine is much lower than before. Mm -hmm. I think the wars uh, are very much challenging for the states and for our state. And the state and this uh, like big, um, infrastructural uh, 
units which are today controlled by the state, uh, they are the guarantee for people to survive, to live, to have kind of normality in the regions where um, yeah, the attacks are not uh, happening every day, like uh, in eastern part of Ukraine or in the south. So uh, I think this um, much bigger role of the state can be also an important basis for the future composition of Ukraine. Of you. <coughs> but we will see. And uh, uh, yeah, Ukrainian oligarchs uh, are losing the, how to say, actives, yeah, their capital every day. And yeah, like all the other people. So they are also. Yeah, we can. In my opinion, in my opinion, they are not so powerful anymore. Of course, they are still very rich in influential people, but politically, in, in our political landscape, there is not so much space for them. And uh, we have another media politics today. I don't know if you know, we have only one channel. It's like a marathon of news provided by different uh, channels, but they have no, no like own waves. They are all in one, <laughs> yeah in one channel and uh, there is uh, there are no like alter alternative narratives which were uh, previously uh, supported or elaborated by uh, media uh, of different oligarchs and of different oligarchic interests yeah, that's why the role of uh, this kind of capital today is not really clear. Mm. Okay. But as far as I know, they are all supporting Ukraine. <laughs> okay. The army, some projects, uh, I don't know, spend, uh, spend their money, give, uh, are giving their money back. But as usual, not all of the money, of course. <laughs> 